Georg Ferdinand Ludwig Philipp Cantor was a German mathematician, best known as the inventor of set theory, which has become a fundamental theory in mathematics. Cantor established the importance of one-to-one -one correspondence between the members of two sets, defined infinite and well-ordered sets, and proved that the real numbers are more numerous than the natural numbers. In fact, Cantor's method of proof of this theorem implies the existence of an infinity of infinities. He defined the cardinal and ordinal numbers in their arithmetic. Cantor's work is of great philosophical interest, a fact of which he was well aware. Cantor's theory of transfinite numbers was originally regarded as so counterintuitive a euro even shocking a euro that it encountered resistance from mathematical contemporaries such as Leopold Kronecker and Henri Poincaré copyright and later from Hermann Well and L. E. J. Boer, while Ludwig Wittgenstein raised philosophical objections. Some Christian theologians saw Cantor's work as a challenge to the uniqueness of the absolute infinity and the nature of God a euro on one occasion equating the theory of transfinite numbers with pantheism a euro a proposition that Cantor vigorously rejected. The objections to Cantor's work were occasionally fierce, Poincaré copyright referred to his ideas as a grave disease infecting the discipline of mathematics and Kronecker's public opposition and personal attacks included describing Cantor as a scientific charlatan, a renegade, and a corrupter of youth. Kronecker even objected to Cantor's proofs that the algebraic numbers are countable, and that the transcendental numbers are uncountable, results now included in a standard mathematics curriculum. Writing decades after Cantor's death, Wittgenstein lamented that mathematics is written through and through with the pernicious idioms of set theory, which he dismissed as utter nonsense that is laughable, and wrong. Cantor's recurring bouts of depression from 1884 to the end of his life have been blamed on the hostile attitude of many of his contemporaries, though some have explained these episodes as probable manifestations of a bipolar disorder. The harsh criticism has been matched by later accolades. In 1904, the Royal Society awarded Cantor its Sylvester Medal, the highest honor it can confer for work in mathematics. It has been suggested that Cantor believed his theory of transfinite numbers had been communicated to him by God. David Hilbert defended it from its critics by famously declaring, No one shall expel us from the paradise that Cantor has created. Life, Youth and Studies Cantor was born in the Western Merchant Colony in St. Petersburg, Russia, and brought up in the city until he was eleven. Georg, the oldest of six children, was regarded as an outstanding violinist. His grandfather Franz Bar Paragraph H.M. was a well-known musician and soloist in a Russian imperial orchestra. Cantor's father had been a member of the St. Petersburg Stock Exchange. When he became ill, the family moved to Germany in 1856, first to Wiesbaden then to Frankfurt, seeking winters milder than those of St. Petersburg. In 1860, Cantor graduated with distinction from the Rolls-Huel in Darmstadt. His exceptional skills in mathematics, trigonometry in particular, were noted. In 1862, Cantor entered the University of Tsar one quarter rich. After receiving a substantial inheritance upon his father's death in 1863, Cantor shifted his studies to the University of Berlin, attending lectures by Leopold Kronecker, Karl Weierstrass and Ernst Kummer. He spent the summer of 1866 at the University of Gar Paragraph Tingen, then and later a center for mathematical research. Teacher and researcher, in 1867, Cantor completed his dissertation, on number theory, at the University of Berlin. After teaching briefly in a Berlin girls' school, Cantor took up a position at the University of Halle, where he spent his entire career. He was awarded the requisite habilitation for his thesis, also on number theory, which he presented in 1869 upon his appointment at Halle. In 1874, Cantor married Valley Gutmann. They had six children, the last born in 1886. Cantor was able to support a family despite modest academic pay, thanks to his inheritance from his father. During his honeymoon in the Hertz Mountains, Cantor spent much time in mathematical discussions with Richard Dedekind whom he had met two years earlier while on Swiss holiday. Cantor was promoted to extraordinary professor in 1872 and made full professor in 1879. 
to attain the latter rank at the age of 34 was a notable accomplishment, but Cantor desired a chair at a more prestigious university, in particular at Berlin, at that time the leading German university. However, his work encountered too much opposition for that to be possible. Kronecker, who headed mathematics at Berlin until his death in 1891, became increasingly uncomfortable with the prospect of having Cantor as a colleague, perceiving him as a corrupter of youth for teaching his ideas to a younger generation of mathematicians. Worse yet, Kronecker, a well-established figure within the mathematical community and Cantor's former professor, disagreed fundamentally with the thrust of Cantor's work. Kronecker, now seen as one of the founders of the constructive viewpoint in mathematics, disliked much of Cantor's set theory because it asserted the existence of sets satisfying certain properties, without giving specific examples of sets whose members did indeed satisfy those properties. Cantor came to believe that Kronecker's stance would make it impossible for him ever to leave Halle. In 1881, Cantor's Halle colleague Duard Heine died, creating a vacant chair. Halle accepted Cantor's suggestion that it be offered to Dedekind, Heinrich M. Weber and Franz Mertens, in that order, but each declined the chair after being offered it. Friedrich Wangerin was eventually appointed, but he was never close to Cantor. In 1882, the mathematical correspondence between Cantor and Dedekind came to an end, apparently as a result of Dedekind's declining the chair at Halle. Cantor also began another important correspondence, with Gar Paragraph Star Mittagelefeller in Sweden, and soon began to publish in Mittagelefeller's journal Acta Mathematica. But in 1885, Mittagelefeller was concerned about the philosophical nature and new terminology in a paper Cantor had submitted to Acta. He asked Cantor to withdraw the paper from Acta while it was in proof, writing that it was about 100 years too soon. Cantor complied but then curtailed his relationship and correspondence with Mittagelefeller, writing to a third party. Had Mittagelefeller had his way, I should have to wait until the year 1984, which to me seemed too great a demand. But of course I never want to know anything again about Acta Mathematica. Cantor suffered his first known bout of depression in 1884. Criticism of his work weighed on his mind, Every one of the 52 letters he wrote to Mittagelefeller in 1884 mentioned Kronecker. A passage from one of these letters is revealing of the damage to Cantor's self-confidence. I don't know when I shall return to the continuation of my scientific work. At the moment I can do absolutely nothing with it, and limit myself to the most necessary duty of my lectures. How much happier I would be to be scientifically active, if only I had the necessary mental freshness. This crisis led him to apply to lecture on philosophy rather than mathematics. He also began an intense study of Elizabethan literature thinking there might be evidence that Francis Bacon wrote the plays attributed to Shakespeare. This ultimately resulted in two pamphlets, published in 1896 and 1897. Cantor recovered soon thereafter, and subsequently made further important contributions, including his famous diagonal argument and theorem. However, he never again attained the high level of his remarkable papers of 1874 Euro 84. He eventually sought, and achieved, a reconciliation with Kronecker. Nevertheless, the philosophical disagreements and difficulties dividing them persisted. In 1890, Cantor was instrumental in founding the Deutsche Mathematiker Vereinigung and chaired its first meeting in Halle in 1891, where he first introduced his diagonal argument. His reputation was strong enough, despite Kronecker's opposition to his work, to ensure he was elected as the first president of this society. Setting aside the animosity Kronecker had displayed towards him, Cantor invited him to address the meeting, but Kronecker was unable to do so because his wife was dying from injuries sustained in a skiing accident at the time. Late years, after Cantor's 1884 hospitalization, there is no record that he was in any sanatorium again until 1899. Soon after that second hospitalization, Cantor's youngest son Rudolf died suddenly, and this tragedy drained Cantor of much of his passion for mathematics. Cantor was again hospitalized in 1903. One year later, he was outraged and agitated by a paper presented by Julius Carr Paragraph Nigg at the Third International Congress of Mathematicians. 
the paper attempted to prove that the basic tenets of transfinite set theory were false. Since the paper had been read in front of his daughters and colleagues, Cantor perceived himself as having been publicly humiliated. Although Ernst Zermelo demonstrated less than a day later that car paragraph Nick's proof had failed, Cantor remained shaken, and momentarily questioning God. Cantor suffered from chronic depression for the rest of his life, for which he was excused from teaching on several occasions and repeatedly confined in various sanatoria. The events of 1904 preceded a series of hospitalizations at intervals of two or three years. He did not abandon mathematics completely, however, lecturing on the paradoxes of set theory to a meeting of the Deutsche Mathematiker Euro Verenigung in 1903, and attending the International Congress of Mathematicians at Heidelberg in 1904. In 1911, Cantor was one of the distinguished foreign scholars invited to attend the 500th anniversary of the founding of the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Cantor attended, hoping to meet Bertrand Russell, whose newly published Principia Mathematica repeatedly cited Cantor's work, but this did not come about. The following year, St. Andrews awarded Cantor an honorary doctorate, but illness precluded his receiving the degree in person. Cantor retired in 1913, living in poverty and suffering from malnourishment during World War I. The public celebration of his 70th birthday was cancelled because of the war. He died on January 6, 1918 in the sanatorium where he had spent the final year of his life. Mathematical work, Cantor's work between 1874 and 1884 is the origin of set theory. Prior to this work, the concept of a set was a rather elementary one that had been used implicitly since the beginning of mathematics, dating back to the ideas of Aristotle. No one had realized that set theory had any non-trivial content. Before Cantor, there were only finite sets and the infinite. By proving that there are many possible sizes for infinite sets, Cantor established that set theory was not trivial, and it needed to be studied. Set theory has come to play the role of a foundational theory in modern mathematics, in the sense that it interprets propositions about mathematical objects from all the traditional areas of mathematics in a single theory, and provides a standard set of axioms to prove or disprove them. The basic concepts of set theory are now used throughout mathematics. In one of his earliest papers, Cantor proved that the set of real numbers is more numerous than the set of natural numbers. This showed for the first time, that there exist infinite sets of different sizes. He was also the first to appreciate the importance of one-to-one -one correspondences in set theory. He used this concept to define finite and infinite sets, subdividing the latter into denumerable sets and uncountable sets. Cantor developed important concepts in topology and their relation to cardinality. For example, he showed that the Cantor set is nowhere dense, but has the same cardinality as the set of all real numbers, whereas the rationals are everywhere dense, but countable. Cantor introduced fundamental constructions in set theory, such as the power set of a set A, which is the set of all possible subsets of A. He later proved that the size of the power set of A is strictly larger than the size of A, even when A is an infinite set. This result soon became known as Cantor's theorem. Cantor developed an entire theory and arithmetic of infinite sets, called cardinals and ordinals, which extended the arithmetic of the natural numbers. His notation for the cardinal numbers was the Hebrew letter with a natural number subscript. For the ordinals he employed the Greek letter I per mil. This notation is still in use today. The continuum hypothesis, introduced by Cantor, was presented by David Hilbert as the first of his 23 open problems in his famous address at the 1900 International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris. Cantor's work also attracted favorable notice beyond Hilbert's celebrated encomium. The U.S. philosopher Charles Sanders Park praised Cantor's set theory, and, following public lectures delivered by Cantor at the first International Congress of Mathematicians, held in Zurich in 1897, Heretz and Hadamard also both expressed their admiration. At that congress, Cantor renewed his friendship and correspondence with Dedekind. From 1905, Cantor corresponded with his British admirer and translator Philip Jerdin on the history of set theory and on Cantor's religious ideas. 
This was later published, as were several of his expository works. Number theory, trigonometric series and ordinals, Cantor's first ten papers were on number theory, his thesis topic. At the suggestion of Duarte Heine, the professor at Halle, Cantor turned to analysis. Heine proposed that Cantor solve an open problem that had eluded Peter Gustav Lejon Dirichlet, Rudolf Lipschitz, Bernhard Riemann, and Heine himself, the uniqueness of the representation of a function by trigonometric series. Cantor solved this difficult problem in 1869. It was while working on this problem that he discovered transfinite ordinals, which occurred as indices n in the nth derived set Sn of a set S of zeros of a trigonometric series. Given a trigonometric series f, x, with S as its set of zeros, Cantor had discovered a procedure that produced another trigonometric series that had S1 as its set of zeros, where S1 is the set of limit points of S. If Sk plus 1 is the set of limit points of Sk, then he could construct a trigonometric series whose zeros are Sk plus 1. Because the sets Sk were closed, they contained their limit points, and the intersection of the infinite decreasing sequence of sets S, S1, S2, S3, formed a limit set, which we would now call C per mil, and then he noticed that C per mil would also have to have a set of limit points C per mil plus 1, and so on. He had examples that went on forever, and so here was a naturally occurring infinite sequence of infinite numbers I per mil, I per mil plus 1, I per mil plus 2. Between 1870 and 1872, Cantor published more papers on trigonometric series, and also a paper defining irrational numbers as convergent sequences of rational numbers. Dedekind, whom Cantor befriended in 1872, cited this paper later that year, in the paper where he first set out his celebrated definition of real numbers by Dedekind cuts. While extending the notion of number by means of his revolutionary concept of infinite cardinality, Cantor was paradoxically opposed to theories of infinitesimals of his contemporaries Otto Stoltz and Paul Du Bois Raymond, describing them as both an abomination, and a cholera bacillus of mathematics. Cantor also published an erroneous proof of the inconsistency of infinitesimals. Set Theory the beginning of set theory as a branch of mathematics is often marked by the publication of Cantor's 1874 article, Adabrani against Schaaf de in Begriffes aller realen algebraischen Zellen. This article was the first to provide a rigorous proof that there was more than one kind of infinity. Previously, all infinite collections had been implicitly assumed to be echinumerous. Cantor proved that the collection of real numbers and the collection of positive integers are not echinumerous. In other words, the real numbers are not countable. His proof is more complex than the more elegant diagonal argument that he gave in 1891. Cantor's article also contains a new method of constructing transcendental numbers. Transcendental numbers were first constructed by Joseph Liouville in 1844. Cantor established these results using two constructions. His first construction shows how to write the real algebraic numbers as a sequence A1, A2, A3, A, in other words, the real algebraic numbers are countable. Cantor starts his second construction with any sequence of real numbers. Using this sequence, he constructs nested intervals whose intersection contains a real number not in the sequence. Since every sequence of real numbers can be used to construct a real not in the sequence, the real numbers cannot be written as a sequence a euro that is, the real numbers are not countable. By applying his construction to the sequence of real algebraic numbers, Cantor produces a transcendental number. Cantor points out that his constructions prove more a euro namely, they provide a new proof of Liouville's theorem, every interval contains infinitely many transcendental numbers. Cantor's next article contains a construction that proves the set of transcendental numbers has the same power as the set of real numbers. Between 1879 and 1884, Cantor published a series of six articles in Mathematischanalen that together formed an introduction to his set theory. At the same time, there was growing opposition to Cantor's ideas, led by Kronecker, who admitted mathematical concepts only if they could be constructed in a finite number of steps from the natural numbers, which he took as intuitively given. For Kronecker, 
Cantor's hierarchy of infinities was inadmissible, since accepting the concept of actual infinity would open the door to paradoxes which would challenge the validity of mathematics as a whole. Cantor also introduced the Cantor set during this period. The fifth paper in the series, Grundlagen einer Algemeinen Mannigfaltig Kiertzlu, published in 1883, was the most important of the six and was also published as a separate monograph. It contained Cantor's reply to his critics and showed how the transfinite numbers were a systematic extension of the natural numbers. It begins by defining well-ordered sets. Ordinal numbers are then introduced as the order types of well-ordered sets. Cantor then defines the addition and multiplication of the cardinal and ordinal numbers. In 1885, Cantor extended his theory of order types so that the ordinal numbers simply became a special case of order types. In 1891, he published a paper containing his elegant diagonal argument for the existence of an uncountable set. He applied the same idea to prove Cantor's theorem, the cardinality of the power set of a set A is strictly larger than the cardinality of A. This established the richness of the hierarchy of infinite sets, and of the cardinal and ordinal arithmetic that Cantor had defined. His argument is fundamental in the solution of the halting problem and the proof of Gar paragraph Dell's first incompleteness theorem. Cantor wrote on the Goldbach conjecture in 1894. In 1895 and 1897, Cantor published a two part paper in Mathematische Annalen under Felix Klein's editorship. These were his last significant papers on set theory. The first paper begins by defining set, subset, etc in ways that would be largely acceptable now. The cardinal and ordinal arithmetic are reviewed. Cantor wanted the second paper to include a proof of the continuum hypothesis, but had to settle for expositing his theory of well-ordered sets and ordinal numbers. Cantor attempts to prove that if A and B are sets with A equivalent to a subset of B and B equivalent to a subset of A, then A and B are equivalent. Ernst Schrer paragraph Der had stated this theorem a bit earlier, but his proof, as well as Cantor's, was flawed. Felix Bernstein supplied a correct proof in his 1898 PhD thesis. Hence the name Cantor a Euro Bernstein a Euro Schroeder theorem. One to one correspondence. Cantor's 1874 Krell paper was the first to invoke the notion of a one to one correspondence, though he did not use that phrase. He then began looking for a one-to-one -one correspondence between the points of the unit square and the points of a unit line segment. In an 1877 letter to Dedekind, Cantor proved a far stronger result, for any positive integer n, there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between the points on the unit line segment and all of the points in an n-dimensional space. About this discovery Cantor famously wrote to Dedekind, Je la voie, Marie-Génie la croix par. The result that he found so astonishing has implications for geometry and the notion of dimension. In 1878, Cantor submitted another paper to Krell's journal, in which he defined precisely the concept of a one-to-one -one correspondence, and introduced the notion of power, or equivalence of sets. Two sets are equivalent if there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. Cantor defined countable sets as sets which can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, and proved that the rational numbers are denumerable. He also proved that n-dimensional Euclidean space Rn has the same power as the real numbers R, as does a countably infinite product of copies of R. While he made free use of countability as a concept, he did not write the word countable until 1883. Cantor also discussed his thinking about dimension, stressing that his mapping between the unit interval and the unit square was not a continuous one. This paper displeased Kronecker, and Cantor wanted to withdraw it. However, Dedekin persuaded him not to do so and Weierstra supported its publication. Nevertheless, Cantor never again submitted anything to Krell. Continuum Hypothesis Cantor was the first to formulate what later came to be known as the Continuum Hypothesis or CH. There exists no set whose power is greater than that of the naturals and less than that of the reals. Cantor believed the continuum hypothesis to be true and tried for many years to prove it, in vain. His inability to prove the continuum hypothesis caused him considerable anxiety. 
the difficulty Cantor had in proving the continuum hypothesis has been underscored by later developments in the field of mathematics, a 1940 result by Gar Paragraph Dell and a 1963 one by Paul Cohen together imply that the continuum hypothesis can neither be proved nor disproved using standards Amilo or euro frankel set theory plus the axiom of choice. Paradoxes of set theory Discussions of set theoretic paradoxes began to appear around the end of the 19th century. Some of these implied fundamental problems with Cantor's set theory program. In an 1897 paper on an unrelated topic, Ser Baroli 40 set out the first such paradox, the Baroli 40 paradox, the ordinal number of the set of all ordinals must be an ordinal and this leads to a contradiction. Cantor discovered this paradox in 1895, and described it in an 1896 letter to Hilbert. Criticism mounted to the point where Cantor launched counter-arguments in 1903, intended to defend the basic tenets of his set theory. In 1899, Cantor discovered his eponymous paradox, what is the cardinal number of the set of all sets? Clearly it must be the greatest possible cardinal. Yet for any set A, the cardinal number of the power set of A is strictly larger than the cardinal number of A. This paradox, together with Baroli 40s, led Cantor to formulate a concept called limitation of size, according to which the collection of all ordinals, or of all sets, was an inconsistent multiplicity that was too large to be a set. Such collections later became known as proper classes. One common view among mathematicians is that these paradoxes, together with Russell's paradox, demonstrate that it is not possible to take a naive, or non-axiomatic, approach to set theory without risking contradiction, and it is certain that they were among the motivations for Zermelo and others to produce axiomatizations of set theory. Others note, however, that the paradoxes do not obtain in an informal view motivated by the iterative hierarchy, which can be seen as explaining the idea of limitation of size. Some also question whether the Fijian formulation of naive set theory is really a faithful interpretation of the Cantorian conception. Philosophy, religion, and Cantor's mathematics, the concept of the existence of an actual infinity was an important shared concern within the realms of mathematics, philosophy and religion. Preserving the orthodoxy of the relationship between God and mathematics, although not in the same form as held by his critics, was long a concern of Cantor's. He directly addressed this intersection between these disciplines in the introduction to his Grundlagen einer Algemeinen Mannigfaltig Kietzlu, where he stressed the connection between his view of the infinite and the philosophical one. To Cantor, his mathematical views were intrinsically linked to their philosophical and theological implications. A Euro he identified the absolute infinite with God, and he considered his work on transfinite numbers to have been directly communicated to him by God who had chosen Cantor to reveal them to the world. Debate among mathematicians grew out of opposing views in the philosophy of mathematics regarding the nature of actual infinity. Some held to the view that infinity was an abstraction which was not mathematically legitimate, and denied its existence. Mathematicians from three major schools of thought opposed Cantor's theories in this matter. For constructivists such as Kronecker, this rejection of actual infinity stems from fundamental disagreement with the idea that non-constructive proofs such as Cantor's diagonal argument are sufficient proof that something exists, holding instead that constructive proofs are required. Intuitionism also rejects the idea that actual infinity is an expression of any sort of reality, but arrive at the decision via a different route than constructivism. Firstly, Cantor's argument rests on logic to prove the existence of transfinite numbers as an actual mathematical entity, whereas intuitionists hold that mathematical entities cannot be reduced to logical propositions, originating instead in the intuitions of the mind. Secondly, the notion of infinity as an expression of reality is itself disallowed in intuitionism, since the human mind cannot intuitively construct an infinite set. Mathematicians such as Bohr and especially Poincaré copyright adopted an intuitionist stance against Cantor's work. Citing the paradoxes of set theory as an example of its fundamentally flawed nature, Poincaré copyright held that most of the ideas of Cantorian set theory should be banished from mathematics once and for all. Finally, Wittgenstein's attacks were finitist, 
he believed that Cantor's diagonal argument conflated the intention of a set of cardinal or real numbers with its extension, thus conflating the concept of rules for generating a set with an actual set. Some Christian theologians saw Cantor's work as a challenge to the uniqueness of the absolute infinity and the nature of God. In particular, Neo-Thomas thinkers saw the existence of an actual infinity that consisted of something other than God as jeopardizing God's exclusive claim to supreme infinity. Kant was strongly believed that this view was a misinterpretation of infinity, and was convinced that set theory could help correct this mistake. The transfinite species are just as much at the disposal of the intentions of the Creator and His absolute boundless will as of the finite numbers. Cantor also believed that his theory of transfinite numbers ran counter to both materialism and determinism a euro, and was shocked when he realized that he was the only faculty member at Halle who did not hold to deterministic philosophical beliefs. In 1888, Cantor published his correspondence with several philosophers on the philosophical implications of his set theory. In an extensive attempt to persuade other Christian thinkers and authorities to adopt his views, Cantor had corresponded with Christian philosophers such as Tilman Pesch and Joseph Ontheim, as well as theologians such as Cardinal Johannes Franzlin, who once replied by equating the theory of transfinite numbers with pantheism. Cantor even sent one letter directly to Pope Leo XIII himself, and addressed several pamphlets to him. Cantor's philosophy on the nature of numbers led him to affirm a belief in the freedom of mathematics to posit and prove concepts apart from the realm of physical phenomena, as expressions within an internal reality. The only restrictions on this metaphysical system are that all mathematical concepts must be devoid of internal contradiction, and that they follow from existing definitions, axioms, and theorems. This belief is summarized in his famous assertion that the essence of mathematics is its freedom. These ideas parallel those of Edmund Husserl, whom Cantor had met in Halle. Meanwhile, Cantor himself was fiercely opposed to infinitesimals, describing them as both an abomination, and the cholera bacillus of mathematics. Cantor's 1883 paper reveals that he was well aware of the opposition his ideas were encountering. I realize that in this undertaking I place myself in a certain opposition to views widely held concerning the mathematical infinite and to opinions frequently defended on the nature of numbers. Hence he devotes much space to justifying his earlier work, asserting that mathematical concepts may be freely introduced as long as they are free of contradiction and defined in terms of previously accepted concepts. He also cites Aristotle, Descartes, Berkeley, Leibniz, and Bolzano on infinity. Cantor's ancestry. Cantor's paternal grandparents were from Copenhagen, and fled to Russia from the disruption of the Napoleonic Wars. There is very little direct information on his grandparents. Cantor was sometimes called Jewish in his lifetime, but has also variously been called Russian, German, and Danish as well. Jacob Cantor, Cantor's grandfather, gave his children Christian saints' names. Further, several of his grandmother's relatives were in the Tsarist civil service, which would not welcome Jews, unless they converted to Christianity. Cantor's father, Georg Waldmer Cantor, was educated in the Lutheran mission in St. Petersburg, and his correspondence with his son shows both of them as devout Lutherans. Very little is known for sure about George Waldmer's origin or education. His mother, Maria Anna Bar Paragraph H.M., was an Austro-Hungarian born in St. Petersburg and baptized Roman Catholic. She converted to Protestantism upon marriage. However, there is a letter from Cantor's brother Louis to their mother, stating, Ma paragraph gen wazinal von Judenabstammen und ich im Prinzip noch so so far one quarter agleich Britagung der Hebra currency ersehen, im socialen Leben sind mir Christen lieber. Even if we were descended from Jews ten times over, and even though I may be, in principle, completely in favor of equal rights for Hebrews, in social life I prefer Christians. Which could be read to imply that she was of Jewish ancestry. There were documented statements, during the 1930s, that called this Jewish ancestry into question. More often, that is, than the ancestry of the mother the question has been discussed of whether Georg Cantor was of Jewish origin. 
about this it is reported in a notice of the Danish Genealogical Institute in Copenhagen from the year 1937 concerning his father, it is hereby testified that Georg Wildmer Kantor, born 1809 or 1814, is not present in the registers of the Jewish community, and that he completely without doubt was not a Jew. It is also later said in the same document. Also efforts for a long time by the librarian Joseph Fischer, one of the best experts on Jewish genealogy in Denmark, charged with identifying Jewish professors, that Georg Cantor was of Jewish descent, finished without result. Something seems to be wrong with this sentence, but the meaning seems clear enough. In Cantor's published works and also in his Nakhlis there are no statements by himself which relate to a Jewish origin of his ancestors. There is to be sure in the Nakhlis a copy of a letter of his brother Ludwig from November 18, 1869 to their mother with some unpleasant anti-Semitic statements, in which it is said among other things, a. Eh? The rest of the quote is finished by the very first quote above. In Men of Mathematics, Eric Temple Bell described Cantor as being of pure Jewish descent on both sides, although both parents were baptized. In a 1971 article entitled Towards a Biography of Georg Cantor, the British historian of mathematics Ivor Grattan Guinness mentions that he was unable to find evidence of Jewish ancestry. In a letter written by Georg Cantor to Paul Tannery in 1896, Cantor states that his paternal grandparents were members of the Sephardic Jewish community of Copenhagen. Specifically, Cantor states in describing his father, Arista Baron Copenhagen Jebron, Von Israelitischen Elton, die der Dortischen Portugiesischen Judengemeinde. Parents from the local Portuguese Jewish community. In addition, Cantor's maternal great uncle, a Hungarian violinist Joseph Bar Paragraph H.M., has been described as Jewish, which may imply that Cantor's mother was at least partly descended from the Hungarian Jewish community. In a letter to Bertrand Russell, Cantor described his ancestry and self perception as follows. Neither my father nor my mother were of German blood, the first being a Dane, born in Copenhagen, my mother of Austrian Hungar dissension. You must know, sir, that I am not a regular just Germain, for I am born March 3, 1845 at St. Peterborough, capital of Russia, but I went with my father and mother and brothers and sister, eleven years old in the year 1856, into Germany. Historiography, until the 1970s, the chief academic publications on Cantor were two short monographs by Schaparagraph Nfliis a Euro largely the correspondence with Mitterbeler a Euro, and Frankel. Both were at second and third hand. Neither had much on his personal life. The gap was largely filled by Eric Temple Bell's Men of Mathematics, which one of Cantor's modern biographers describes as perhaps the most widely read modern book on the history of mathematics, and as one of the worst. Bell presents Cantor's relationship with his father as Oedipal, Cantor's differences with Kronecker as a quarrel between two Jews, and Cantor's madness as romantic despair over his failure to win acceptance for his mathematics, and fills the picture with stereotypes. Grattan Guinness found that none of these claims were true, but they may be found in many books of the intervening period, owing to the absence of any other narrative. There are other legends, independent of Bella Euro including one that labels Cantor's father a foundling, shipped to St. Petersburg by unknown parents. A critique of Bell's book is contained in Joseph Dauben's biography. See also Cantor Algebra, Cantor Cube, Cantor Function, Cantor Medal a Euro Award by the Deutsche Mathematiker Vereinigung in honor of Georg Cantor. Cantor Set, Cantor Space, Cantor's Back and Forth Method. Controversy over Cantor's theory, he in the Euro Cantor theorem, infinity, list of German inventors and discoverers, pairing function, notes. References Dauben, Joseph W., Georg Cantor and Pope Leo XIII, Mathematics, Theology, and the Infinite, Journal of the History of Ideas 38, 85 a Euro 108, JSTOR A 2708842A. Dauben, Joseph W., Georg Cantor, His Mathematics and Philosophy of the Infinite, Boston, Harvard University Press, ISBN A 978-0-691-02447-9A. Dauben, Joseph, 
Georg Canton The Battle for Transfinite Set Theory, Proceedings at the 9th ACMS Conference, PPA 1 the Euro 22A. Internet version published in Journal of the ACMS 2004. B. Weld, William B., ed., From Immanuel Kant to David Hilbert, a source book in the Foundations of Mathematics, New York, Oxford University Press, ISBN A978-0-19-853264. Grattan Guinness, Ivor, Towards a Biography of Georg Cantor, Annals of Science 27, 345 Euro 391, doi, 10.1080-00033797100203837A. Grattan Guinness, Ivor, The Search for Mathematical Roots, 1870 Euro 1940, Princeton University Press. ISBN A 978-0-691-05858-0A. Hallett, Michael, Cantorian Set Theory and Limitation of Size, New York, Oxford University Press, ISBN A 0-19-853283-0A. Pickert, Walter. Ilgotes, Hans Joachim, Georg Cantor. 1845 a Euro 1918, Berker Currency User, ISBN A 0 8176 1 a Supps, Patrick, Axiomatic Set Theory, New York, Dover, ISBN A 0 486 61630 4A. Although the presentation is axiomatic rather than naive, Supps proves and discusses many of Cantor's results which demonstrates Cantor's continued importance for the edifice of foundational mathematics. Bibliography, older sources on Cantor's life should be treated with caution. See historiography section above. Primary literature in English, Cantor, Georg, 1915, Philip Jerdin, ed., Contributions to the Founding of the Theory of Transfinite Numbers, New York. Dover, ISBN A 978-0-486-60045-1A. Primary Literature in German, Cantor, Georg, Weberani against Schaft der Inbegriffes aller realen Algebraischen Zellen, Journal Far 1 Quarter ad I Reine und Mathematik 77, 258 Euro 262A. Cantor, Georg, Grundlagen einer Algemeinen Mannigfaltig Kiez Lu. Mathematisch Annalen 21, 545 Euro 586 A. Cantor, Georg. Beitra Currency G. E. Zerbegra 1 Korten Dung der Transfinet Mingen Lu. Mathematisch Annalen 46, 481 Euro 512 A. Cantor, Georg. Beitra Currency G. E. Zerbegra 1 Korten Dung der Transfinet Mingen Lu. Mathematisch Annalen 49. 207 a Euro 246 a, Cantor, Georg, Ernst Zermelo, ed., Gesammelt ab und Lungen Mathematischen und Philosophischen Inhalts, Berlin, Springera. Almost everything that Cantor wrote. Includes excerpts of his correspondence with Dedekind and Frenkel's Cantor biography in the appendix. Secondary literature, Atchel, Amir D., The Mystery of the LF, Mathematics, The Kabbalah, and the Search for Infinity, New York, Four Walls Eight Windows Publishing. ISBN 0 7607 7778 0. A popular treatment of infinity, in which Cantor is frequently mentioned. Dauben, Joseph W., Georg Cantor and the Origins of Transfinite Set Theory, Scientific American 248, 122 Euro 131 a. Ferrera Cube des, Joseph Copyright, Labyrinth of Thought, A History of Set Theory and Its Role in Mathematical Thought, Basel, Switzerland, Berger Currency User. ISBN 3-7643-8349-6 contains a detailed treatment of both Cantor's and Dedekind's contributions to set theory. Halmos, Paul, Naive Set Theory, New York and Berlin, Springer. ISBN 3-540-90092-6, Hilbert, David. Arbidas on English. Mathematician Allen 95, 
161 Hill, C.O. Rosado Haddock, G.E., Hustle or Free Each. Meaning, Objectivity, and Mathematics, Chicago, Open Quarter. ISBN 0 8126 9538 03 Chapters and 18 Index Entries on Cantor. Mishkowski, Herbert, Georg Cantor, Leben, Work und Wakung, Wyatt Wegg, Brands Twigger, Penrose, Roger, The Road to Reality, Alfred A. Nopair. ISBN 0 679 77631 1 Chapter 16 illustrates how Cantorian thinking intrigues a leading contemporary theoretical physicist. Rucker, Rudy, Infinity in the Mind, Princeton University Presser. ISBN 0-553-25531-2 deals with similar topics to actual, but in more depth. Rudich, Victor, Wittgenstein's Philosophy of Mathematics, in Edward N. Zalter, The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. External links, O'Connor, John J. Robertson, Edmund F. Georg Cantor, Maxita History of Mathematics Archive, University of St. Andrews. O'Connor, John J. Robertson, Edmund F., A History of Set Theory, Maxita History of Mathematics Archive, University of St. Andrews. Mainly devoted to Cantor's accomplishment. Georg Cantor at the Mathematics Genealogy Project, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Set Theory by Thomas J. H. Grammar School Georg Cantor Halle, Georg Cantor Gymnasium Halle, Poem about Georg Cantor